Wired.com presents The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. And here is your host, David Barr Kirtley. Hello, and welcome to episode 366 of Geek's Guide to the Galaxy. Our guest today is Rob Reed. He's a Silicon Valley entrepreneur who founded Listen.com, which built the Rhapsody online music service and created the unlimited subscription model since adopted by Apple, Spotify, and many others. He's also the author of the nonfiction books Year One and Architects of the Web and the New York Times bestselling science fiction novel Year Zero. And we'll be speaking with him today about his new novel After On. And now here's our interview with Rob Reed. All right, so we're here with Rob Reed. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Okay, so your writing career started back in the 90s with two nonfiction books. So tell us about that. Yeah, the very first book I wrote was um, about what it's like to be a first-year student at Harvard Business School, which I was an expert in at the time as I was going through that process. And uh, it was kind of a meld between memoir, nonfiction, and a little element of fiction because I mean, it's mainly you know my own experiences. So that's memoir, obviously. Um, but it was really meant for people who wanted to figure out if business school was something that they wanted to do. And I decided to populate the book with essentially my five imaginary friends because I didn't want to write about actual folks because people wouldn't necessarily want that. And I also wanted to pull together a diversity of experiences and be able to cause events to happen in the lives of my imaginary friends. And so I basically recruited um, classmates who went through different experiences that were very, very, you know, kind of canonical. There was, you know, one of the, uh, one of my friends was head of the Women's Students Association. Um, there was, you know, somebody who was a uh, former military et cetera, foreign students, try to kind of like diversify the student experience. And then I had my friends basically read and help me edit and tell the story of what it was like to be a business school student from the perspective of these folks. Um, my second book was about the rise of the internet as a commercial medium, and it was called Architects of the Web. And I wrote that as it was happening. And so I had this great um, ability to interview practically anybody who was doing anything interesting in the internet because it was early. It was 1996. I had been an internet full-timer myself, so I had a pretty good network. And I was basically just trying to translate all of the excitement and the technical complexity and make it accessible to people who, you know, at that point, AOL was considered to be fairly exotic, mm -hmm. you know, to kind of like a mainstream, again, more of a business uh, audience. When you say internet full-timer, what do you mean? I, would, I, I mean, in 1994, um, I was one of a fairly tiny handful of people in Silicon Valley who were work, who was working full time on an internet product. And so uh, I was working at a company called Silicon Graphics and we had a line of web servers. We're pretty much the first um, systems that were designated as web servers. This was long before, you know, anybody had, you know, cloud computing or you had to run your basically your own networks operations back then. And so we sold into that. And so for the tiny handful of us who were working on that product product line and a few other people at, in similar units at other ginormous companies. Um, and Netscape had just been founded at about the same time, um, and Yahoo was not yet founded. So the number of people who were working really full-time, let's say, on the World Wide Web rather than the Internet, the Internet's a bigger thing, obviously, we couldn't have been more than you know a couple hundred, I think, at that time. So who were some of those people you were making connections with and interviewing? Yeah, so there were eight chapters. There are eight chapters in that book. Um, it's, uh, it includes people like Mark Andreessen. And so I basically took eight entrepreneurs – who were kind of engaging and accessible and basically used them as the gateway to tell their company story. And then their company is the way to talk about a key component of the internet's infrastructure. So there was Mark Andreessen. He was co-founder of Netscape, which was the main browser software, which was kind of the linchpin of the internet in those early days. Uh, Jerry Yang and Yahoo. And that was sort of a vehicle to talk about search engines. Uh, a guy named Rod Glazer had, was running a company called uh, Progressive Networks, later Real Networks. They were doing everything that enabled audio on the internet. So there was basically like talk about the entrepreneur to reveal the company and talk about the company to illuminate that domain of what could happen. You know, um, Hot Wired, uh, which was the original manifestation of Wired online was uh, the subject of another chapter. Well, speaking of Wired, I mean, I, I understand you go way back with Chris Anderson. Did you meet him around that time? Yes. Um, I go way back with two Chris Andersons mm -hmm. because one of them runs TED and another one of them was the editor-in-chief of Wired for 10 years. When I wrote that chapter, chapter in that book, that was actually long before Chris Anderson showed up. So Wired was still being run by its founders, Louis Rossetto and Jane Metcalf. And Wired was really the first 
um, publishing oriented company to make a big bet on internet media. They think they launched Hotwired in something like 1995. And when you now realizing how small Wired was as a business at that time and how big of a chance they were taking, it was really, really audacious of them. So were you seeing yourself as a writer? Was that your career path at that time? I always wanted to be a writer, but I always was kind of in this weird superposition between, you know, doing business and particularly tech business related stuff and also being really, really interested in in writing. And so I did go to business school, obviously, but my first instinct when I got there was to write a book about it. And that got a, a major publisher, went out with uh, William Morrow. And so now it's kind of, I had an agent and I was, had some credibility as a writer and, um, you know, writing a book about the rise of the internet as a commercial medium rather than starting a company was kind of a weird thing to do. I think that was, again, a manifestation of the fact that I was, you know, very much a writer and, a, you know, a, a tech enthusiast who ultimately became an entrepreneur. So my next step was um, I did start a company. I started the Rhapsody, a company called Listen.com that created the Rhapsody Music Service. And we went through our ups and downs and things turned out all right at the end. And after, um, and I actually sold the company to Real Networks to that person that I first yeah. met through writing that book. Um, we certainly didn't have that in mind, you know, many, many years earlier when I, when I uh, interviewed him for my book. Um, but after I sold my company, I really felt like it was time to focus on writing. And I had done, um, I'd done a bunch of stuff. I'd, you know, when I, when I was an entrepreneur, I'd occasionally write, you know, pieces for, for Wired, um, for the Wall Street Journal and so forth. But I really focused full time and really turned to fiction after um, I was done with my company. And I sat down and wrote um, this sort of madcap adventure that probably only somebody who had worked full time in Internet music in its formative years could have written, which was a book called Year Zero, which is about a, a vast alien civilization that is so into American pop music that they accidentally commit the biggest copyright infringement since the dawn of time and thereby bankrupt the entire universe. And I thought the topic, it was obviously it, it geared off of a lot of my PTSD from <laughs> dealing with record labels in the early days of online music. Um, and there's a great deal of um, a serious commentary about the state of intellectual property law, which I think is uh, – is largely, well, at least partly deranged in our society. So there was a serious underpinning to it, but it's still a very, you know, kind of high energy, very playful adventure. And I thought, though, because it had this weird copyright angle that I'd end up self-publishing it, and that was fine with me. But Random House ended up publishing it and under the, in their Delray imprint, which is something that I grew up reading religiously. And so that was that was exciting. And it, it did well enough that I, I get to keep writing, and I'm thrilled about that. It was the New York Times bestseller. It was, momentarily. It was <laughs> only for a week. And it was almost as low, not quite, almost as low as you can get on the list and still be on it. But yes, it was a New York Times bestseller. And so, you know... Whether it's on for a week or for years, it's still you get to say, I'm a New York, New York Times bestselling author. So, <laughs> Now, were you very passionate about music? Did you want to be a musician or how did that interest come about? Yeah, the two things that I've always been most passionate about um, have been music and, and fiction, you know, and that was basically what I inhaled um, as, as a kid and I continue to inhale to this day. Um, I am a very bad guitarist and a less bad, but definitely not gifted songwriter. And so I, you know, every dime that I had went into music when I was a kid and all the way through college and frankly, even beyond that, you know, whatever wasn't going into rent. And, um, I did sort of everybody who's really into music, I think at some point harbors some <laughs> fantasies about actually being able to make a living at it. But it became clear to me, I think even as early as college, that I was not at all going to be gifted as a musician, but I could be as a writer. And so when I started working full time and really had to narrow my, you know, my extracurricular creative interests into one thing to have any hope of getting good at something, writing was, was the clear thing for me. Could you say a bit more about when you say the PTSD informs the novel? Could you yeah. say a bit more about that? <laughs> well, um, back in those days, so I started um, my company right around the time that Napster was coming onto the scene. And I started my company with the intention of being the, the music label's gateway onto the internet. It, to me, it seemed logical that an industry that had transitioned from 78 RPM records to 45s to 33s to tapes to 8-tracks, actually got that backward, 8-tracks <laughs> then to tapes to compact discs, would view the internet as the final and ultimate format. 
And since they made all these transitions, that would, you know, that would be something that would take some thought, but it would be something that would be natural. Um, What happened was that online piracy so freaked out the industry that they kind of went into lockdown and they looked at every single thing that was related to technology and the internet as being, you know, dangerous, you know, destructive, evil, et cetera. And so we ended up in this very odd situation in which there were a lot of companies that were starting up that were really about the wholesale piracy of music. And we were a rare company that was very authentically, you know, indigenous to the internet, a whole bunch of us who had been around from the earliest days, which at that point were only a couple years before, and very, very passionate and sincere about music and bringing it online. You know, we were we were getting meetings, we weren't being sued. But the basic strategy that the industries took seemed to be, we're going to wish very, very, very hard, and eventually the internet will go away. And unfortunately, I mean, I could see why it was traumatizing for them to have all this piracy. Their their profit margins were eroding. Um, it looked like an existential threat to the industry. But our message from the very beginning was like, look, the way to beat piracy is not to wish the internet weren't here, that's not going to work. It's to create something that's a better experience for a fair price. And so we created the first unlimited on-demand streaming service. And our pitch to the labels was, look, this is so much better than the agonizing process of going around on different peer-to-peer services, getting, you know, sketchy file quality, sometimes getting viruses. It took a long time to pirate a collection of MP3 files, a lot of obsessive focus. And our idea was like, look, you can just dial up any song without any friction, feel good about the fact that the people who created it are getting paid. And who in the world would take this really kludgy, crappy, time-consuming, virus-ridden experience of pirating a fraction of MP3s when they can have the whole world's collection of music (laughs) on demand. Now, that sounds really obvious and logical today, but they didn't want to hear that. And so it took us literally probably three years from when I founded the company to finally be, you know, permitted to, to present an alternative to piracy. And that was really hard. And throughout the time, although we were the people who ultimately did bring the music industry um, online, we were the first company to launch the service that's now most minds uh, epitomized by Spotify. Um, We were the first people to do that. And we were the first people to get full catalog licenses from all the major labels. Um, So that was great, but it was a grinding three-year process. And really the music industry came kicking and screaming. And I, I, I understand why. I mean, it had to be really horrifying to see your industry suddenly disintegrating like this. Um, But nonetheless, it was a very, very painful process. And the labels tried very hard to turn this crisis into a kind of sketchy duopoly. The five major labels started two companies. One was called MusicNet and one was called PressPlay because they have brilliant naming people, I guess. Um, that one, the basic idea was that they were going to own those two companies and route all music through them and nobody else. And so they were very reluctant to do business with us. It was really, it was a very um, high pressure situation. Actually, um, Washington got very involved. The Department of Justice started looking at it as being uh, this music net press play situation as being a potential antitrust situation. Um, so it was, it was agonizing. Then how do you go from that to writing about aliens? How did I go? Well, okay. So the, 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 the core dynamic, the core absurdity of, of American uh, copyright law, at least as it pertains to music, is there is a provision that says technically, if you download a naughty MP3 file, uh, you are technically liable for up to $150,000 of damages as a customer. And the labels use this as a bludgeon to, rather than releasing their music through a system like ours or our many competitors who would have been delighted to come out with all kinds of ways of accessing music online, they started suing individuals for this, you know, for basically downloading MP3s. They definitely sued the bejesus out of companies like Napster as well, but they were suing everybody and refusing to let their music out there. Um, and this $150,000 liability is really disproportionate to the crime. And that really alienated an entire generation of music lovers who were also, you know, coming of age and embracing technology. Because the notion that this crime of downloading an MP3 is, let's say, 
I'm going to get the math wrong, let's say 500 times worse than drunk driving. And there were, there were states where the drunk driving first, first penalty was $500, right? right? Yeah. It, it, it's so disproportionate. It's so hard to take seriously. And meanwhile, the fact that the labels are refusing to license their music in any form really trained a generation of people who we hope to turn into our first customers to be morally comfortable with pirating music. It's an absurd law. And it's, and it's laws like, laws like these came up from a very, very cozy relationship that has long existed between big, big media, not independent podcasters like you and me, not scrappy startups like Wired was for so long, um, but ginormous media companies, a very cozy relationship between them and Congress and between them and law enforcement in general. Um, and that became kind of the core absurdity at the heart of this story of year zero, where the, the basic premise is that we humans, and by the way, I happen to believe this fervently, make the most awesome music in the entire <laughs> universe. And it's for reasons of evolutionary psychology that are very complicated, and I deal with them, I think, in paragraph two. So it's a suspend your disbelief thing, but it's kind of playful and fun. And so we make the best music in the universe. And this vast alien civilization has gotten itself to the endpoints of science and, and politics and everything else. And so they basically dedicate their lives to, to consuming and creating great art. And the greatest art of all to them is music. And they make awful, awful music. It really, really sucks. And so they discover our music. And it's like this revelatory moment. Year zero is the moment that they reset their calendars after discovering our music. And it's in the 70s. So it's a lot of disco and pop. And the first thing they hear is the Welcome Pack Cotter theme song. If anybody remembers that TV show. It's called the Cotter moment, on and on and on. But then they fall afoul of our copyright laws. And for complicated reasons that I deal with in another paragraph about midway through the book, they are obliged to honor the fact that they have committed this horror. They've, every copy they've stolen is $150,000 <laughs> worth of stuff. And, and you can translate that using the price of precious metals on earth and so forth. And it's basically the, the, the number is so vast that all the wealth in the universe is de facto owed to us and our, our music lawyers and pop stars. And that all happens in the first uh, three or four pages. And then it's a race between the bad guy aliens who love the music as much as everybody else, but they want their money, so they decide they're going to blow up the earth on the logic that they've already got 40 million tracks. What more do you really need, <laughs> right? And then the good guy aliens don't want that to happen, but of course the good guy aliens are pretty bumbling because they're kind of pop stars, and the bad guy aliens are, are kind of bumbling too, to be honest with you. Um, and on and on it goes. But it's that copyright lunacy that's at the core of it. And I actually, in the course of the book, I think I issue a pretty strident rebuttal of that particular law and the ramifications that it has. So did what, what, what reactions did you get to the book from readers and did people comment or pick up on the points you were making about? Oh yeah, people, people um, I think the, the most readers just enjoyed the story. It's populated with very, you know, kind of vibrant and noisy and in some cases very goofy and in some cases, you know, hopefully charming and in some cases rather wise characters. And I do take that premise of the entire universe being obsessed with 70s pop to, you know, the nth degree. So it's, it's, I think most people just ex access it on that level. But people who went through this, you know, these battles in the early days of online music certainly recognize um, the characters and the issues that are being played out. I mean, I wrote it in, I think it came out in 2012. So I was writing it. I wrote it just a few years after all of this stuff played out, and it was more of an issue in the public mindset than it is now. But, you know, really, um, there were, you know, there were street protests of enormous scale as recently as, you know, 2013, 2014 in Europe. Uh, there, I think that I've forgotten the name of the law, but there was a law that was coming down in Europe that was potentially very, very restrictive in terms of copyright. And you know, this, fl this flares up from time to time still as an issue. Now, when you talk about these aliens wanting to blow up the Earth, particularly in the context of humorous science fiction, that makes me think of Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. Is that a... Well, I mean, there is there is um, that element. The, the, the strongest connective tissue is definitely that it's humorous. And, you know, I think very, very highly of Douglas Adams, and I don't think there's enough playful science fiction, although there's, there's some out there. And so, yeah, I mean, there was, there was sort of a cap tip in that. But, you know, I think, you know, Destruction of the Earth is, has been a great plot driver for many tales. I mean, you said you grew up reading science fiction. Yeah. 
like what were some of your early influences? Well, the one um, that in this context I'd say influenced me the most was Stanislaw Lem. And uh, so he's, for those who don't know, I imagine many of your listeners are quite familiar with him, but for those who don't, he was a Polish science fiction writer, very, very prolific. And um, he didn't always write with a playful tone, but one of my favorite books for, to this day of works of science fiction is called The Siberiad, and it's a collection of short stories, and it's brilliantly funny. But every story in there, and this is also true, I'd say, of his novels as well, every single story in there has this wonderful slapstick vibe to it, but it also wrestles with a very serious question about, you know, whether it's artificial intelligence. I mean, he was wrestling with, you know, what happens when artificial intelligence runs amok as far back as then? You know, what happens when we attain certain mastery over nan nanotechnology, etc.? So it was at, at once very, very playful, but also very serious. And that, that I always really adored about his writing. Um, you know, other stuff I, I, I read um, at a much too early age. I think my parents couldn't have possibly imagined what was in it. Stranger in a Strange Land. Oh, wow. um, I probably read when I was a very early teen, maybe even 12. And it was in an age where it was enough of a struggle to master the concepts and the language and everything else in it that it really stuck with me. I mean, that was kind of like, I wouldn't say it was like sub summoning Everest or anything, but that was, that was a conquest. The Forever War was another one. And um, so those books, I was really excited when I started writing Year Zero. I decided to go back and read a lot. I, I started reading much more literary fiction and things like that as I'd gotten older. And those books in particular, and Stanislaw Lem, The Sib Siberiad, held up and still hold up so magnificently. I was so thrilled to realize that as a full-grown adult, I was as transfixed by the stories and by the characters as I was when I read them. So, yeah, getting to After On, you say in the um, acknowledgments that before you wanted to write this novel of Silicon Valley, that you wanted to write a novel of Silicon Valley. So talk about how that process of how it became this novel of Silicon Valley. Yeah, so I sat down with just the vaguest idea. Um, you know, Year Zero had done, had done well enough that I was, you know, in a position to go back to Del Rey and, and probably, you know, get something published. And really at the time, um, my idea was really simple. I want to do something that is, you know, kind of silly but real, and this time set in today's Silicon Valley, which, you know, I knew very well having been an entrepreneur and also an investor and on that scene for pretty much my whole adult life. And it was really, it was funny. Um, they accepted the idea and we, it, it, there was, it was a very, very vague notion at that point. And right about that time, Silicon Valley, the show came on HBO. And I was thinking about something very much like that, something that was very much grounded in the present. And um, I wasn't quite sure what the science fiction element was going to be to it, but it was really going to be the mission that I originally had for the book was picked up by this HBO show. I'm like, damn it. <laughs> by the time I finish writing this thing and it gets out in the world, it's just going to look like I'm trying to be them. So I'm not even going to go down that path. And um, I had been very intrigued ever since, you know, for fighting my way through 2001, I'd been very, very intrigued by the notion of digital sentience. And um, it qu hadn't quite broken out as a big meme in the tech sphere yet, but people were starting to talk more and more seriously about super AI risk at that point. Um, the book that really touched that off, Nicholas Bostrom's book uh, called Super Intelligence with an incredibly long subtitle that I can't <laughs> remember, um, actually came out after I started writing this book. super intelligent to remember the subtitle. What's that? You'd have to be super intelligent to remember Precisely, the Precisely, yes. Book, yeah. you, you would indeed. And I, I am not, and therefore I don't. Um, but there was already, you know, serious discussion about AI risk, super AI risk. And I decided, you know, I'd really like to focus on that. And I'd like to connect it up with something that really wasn't being talked about at the time, which was social media risk. So when I started writing this in probably 2014 or so, um, there wasn't a lot that none of the talk that we have with like Tristan Harris and, and other people, this was long before the Facebook election hacking. I mean, social media, we're probably at peak social media in terms of its positive image in society. It was still new ish. People were generally viewing it as a positive force. And if to the extent that it was viewed as a negative or negative force it would have just been viewed in the way that like, Oh, TV, you know, people are spending too much time on Facebook. Like they used to say, they spent too much time yeah. on TV. None of the dark themes had really come out. But um, again, I think, 
definitely in inner circles in Silicon Valley, more thoughtful people were starting to think about what could go wrong here. And so Afteron really brought those two things together. And so a little bit of a spoiler, um, but it's impossible to discuss the book without making the spoiler. And I'll add that most readers will see this coming from the first page. Um, Afteron is about a social network that the, the, in the software itself attains consciousness. And it's called Flutter. Uh, the company is called Flutter. And the network's called Flutter, spelled P-H-L-U-T-T-R, because we do know how to spell mm-hmm. in Silicon Valley. Valley. And um, Flutter is this diabolical social media company based in San Francisco, set about nine seconds into the future, I like to say. Um, pretty much, there's pretty much nothing going on technologically in this company or in this story that isn't happening now, with the tiny exception that I push quantum computing a little bit forward. And I, div- you know, I, I took some liberties with what quantum computing might enable in order to enable Flutter to attain consciousness. Basically, a quantum computing node comes onto the network and enables her, and she self-identifies as female, to wake up. And so the story, there's, there's something when you think about it that's inherently um, comedic about a social network um, attaining consciousness and then, it, and then taking its character from a social network. So I kind of describe her as a hyper-intelligent, super-empowered 14-year-old mean girl. Um, and, you know, so there, there is comedic potential in that and there's weirdness in that, but it really is at bottom, I think a serious contemplation on what we could face if AI becomes sentient and becomes far more powerful than we are. And also on what is wrong with social media, which is, you know, again, sometimes you start writing something and then it starts playing out. So you might look like a, you've, you've keyed off of it, but you know, the 26, the, the 2018 elections actually happened after this. So I was a little bit prescient in that regard. I mean, but do you, how do you see Silicon Valley at this point? Because this book seems to present a pretty dark view of a lot of things in Silicon Valley, particularly in terms of the Tony Jepsen character, who I think is absolutely hilarious. Thank you. Um, but is it just because a satirical novel inherently has to present a dark view of its subject or like how light versus dark do you see Silicon Valley at this moment? I think that Silicon Valley, uh, compared to what it was when I got into the scene, so the internet scene... In 1994-95 was so idealistic. There was not really any idea that there would be money made here. I mean, we felt like Netscape was going to do well. Um, I remember when Yahoo got venture funding, we were kind of like, even those of us who were really, really deep, were like, well, well, venture funding? Yahoo? Like, why? What? I mean, it's useful and everything. Um, and so there was an incredible idealism particularly in the internet domain in the very, very early years, that, you know, when you inject billions of dollars, that inevitably gets crowded out. And when you start talking trillions of dollars, it's just a completely different realm. So I would say, compared to the world that we inhabited, you know, back in those dawning days, um, it has become a very grown up place. You know, I mean, there were, it was, there was an equal number of Tony Jepsen, he's he's the uh, founder CEO of Flutter, and he is, um, you know, he is in many ways a caricature of all that can go wrong in a successful Silicon Valley CEO. In those early days, it was a mix of people like him and real sort of very artsy people who had absolutely no financial interest in what was going on, and deep, deep, um, you know, technically savvy you know, coders, software engineers, developers. And it was a very, very heady mix of us. And we all shared, although we were from three-ish radically different cultures and worlds, um, we all shared this this rabid excitement about whether it was, was going to go. And yeah, today I think that, um, I don't think it's any darker. In fact, it's probably a lot less dark uh, in my mind than places like Hollywood and Wall Street. I think there still is more idealism and less cynicism um, drawing people into technology than drawing people into things like finance and and big, 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 big media. Um, and I've, you know, kind of dabbled in all of those worlds. And the potential ultimately does exist monumentally, more in Silicon Valley than anywhere else, to, you know, improve the human condition. And I think that that's still a motivating factor for a lot of people. And actually, I should expand that to synthetic biology as well. I think synthetic biology is profound potential to in, improve the human condition. The moment, this moment in SynBio is kind of like those early days in, in, in the World Wide Web as well. I'll say that's a little bit of an aside, and we'll probably come back to that. Yeah, we definitely will. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, um, I, I actually, it's funny, when I finished the book, 
my fear was that people were going to think I was too much of a fanboy of Silicon Valley and you know, too um, even you know starry eyed about it. Um, but yeah, it's it's easy and I think important to have fun and put a spotlight on some of the things that are broken about it. Um, you know, particularly just, you know, it's there, we don't have the gender balance that we should have. Um, there is very little sense of boundaries in terms of what can and sh what should and should not be done to make a buck. And, um, that probably is a result of the industry growing up so fast and still being in the hands of very, very young people who were not, trained by people within power. I mean, it's funny. If you think about um, most other industrial cycles, by the time a person rose to the point where they had real power in society and, you know, ability to really sort of uh, nudge our culture and nudge the economic system and the way people earn a living, they had probably, you know, come into Industry X. You know, maybe it was finance in the 60s or, you know, Detroit, you know, in the 70s or something. They came into Industry X and there was a whole group of people, not just within their company, but in the industry writ large, who had gotten accustomed to the sort of the balance between wielding power and, you know, well, between, I don't know, the, the balance between um, a company's throw weight in society and the restraint that it should have in light of that. And our industry just grew up so fast that nobody really, we didn't have that sort of inculcation in like, well, this is, this is the way we do things. This is how we interact with the government. You know, this is how, you know, sort of power balances between this industry and regulators. You know, we've grown up together. This is how we interact with the media, et cetera. We've never, we just didn't have that moment. Now I have to ask you about the Amazon reviews. Oh yeah. So characterize the Amazon reviews for me, and then I'll tell you the story behind <laughs> them. Uh, well, so they're all written with this persona, um, Charles Henry Higginsworth III. Yes. And they're all dated, what, 15 or... Pretty far back. years ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and so he, uh, he's sort of this, from what I remember, he's sort of this um, aristocratic personality, but they've lost all the money. And he's always talking in his reviews about his ex-wife and his current wife. And, um, and they're all very arch and, um, often sarcastic and, um, yeah. And so I'm just really wondering, <laughs> did you see this back in 2002? Yeah. Or? So the interesting thing is, as you're alluding, um, is those, those reviews are in fact on Amazon. Uh, the dates are a little bit off, but they basically correspond to the dates on Amazon. So I did actually write all those reviews back in, you know, 2002, 2003 timeframe, um, at that point, I had no notion that I would ever be writing this book. What I was doing is I was running that company I talked about. I was running Listen.com. And I was very stressful in those days. And I had uh, over 100 people working for me. I never managed before. So that's another one of those things that sort of happens in tech that doesn't happen in very many other places. Um, you get all these people working for you. It's like, wow, I never even had an, an admin help me out before. How do I do this? And so... With all that stress and also with my deep interest in creative writing still burning in my chest, um, one of my ways to sort of manage my stress was late at night, I would sit down and write these playful reviews as this imaginary character, Charles Henry Higginsworth III. And I hadn't, at that point, I'd never heard of anybody else doing, you know, playful Amazon reviews. It's kind of a thing now. Um, in fact, it's probably kind of passe now, but I'd never seen anybody else do it at that point. And I just thought it would be kind of... A fun thing for me to do in my off hours to sort of flex my creative muscles and try to use this new medium, this new form of expression, the Amazon review, to tell an autobiographical story about an imaginary person, which just seemed like such a meta thing. And so it was just me writing these reviews and gradually creating as you mentioned, the sort of autobiography of this curious person who was sort of an aristocratic Boston Brahmin, and the money was gone, but they still had this big house on Beacon Hill, and they didn't really have enough money for heating oil, so he had to, you know, he'd be reviewing all these, you know, sort of home improvement, you know, tools and books, because he had to take that into his own hands, he's really bad about it, and most of the reviews would start out talking about product X, and about, you know, immediately take a 180 degree turn, and he'd start griping about his life. <laughs> And um, 
So people started liking these reviews. People started following this imaginary person on Amazon. I, everybody was in on the joke. It was very clear that this was, <laughs> that this was you know, a joke. Um, but I, my goal was to become a top thousand reviewer. And I was well on my way, but I fell short. And I was always very proud of that work. It was something I had a lot of fun with. And then all these years later, I started writing this book. And the book is takes place part of it in that time frame, uh, early kind of first internet bubble. So 2002, 2003, where most of our characters are high school kids. A couple of them are young adults. And then it takes forward, you know, then the, the bulk of the book takes forward place in the in the present day. But I realized that I needed a particular character with a particular voice um, to play a particular role in the book. And I'll be a little bit vague about it because I don't want to be too spoilery. And I realized that this was a perfect place for these Amazon reviews to be integrated into the book. And so there they are. And they're when they first show up, they'll be mysterious to the reader as to why they're there. And that's true of a lot of different media types. So as you know, there is this playful um, second novel, there's a novel within the novel. And that novel within the novel, I am quite convinced if I ever finished it, uh, and I won't, uh, <laughs> would be the single worst science fiction novel ever written. And it's sort of like the Amazon reviews, it sort of starts cropping up early in the book without a whole lot, without any explanation. And hopefully it's funny and playful enough on its own to engage people and the mystery of why is this thing keep coming back? You know, these the Amazon reviews between chapters and these s excerpts from the strange book, all of that does start coming together. And there's also, there's blog posts and there's tweets and, you know, there's, there's op-eds from the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the San Francisco Chronicle. And there's other sort of media types that come in. And part of that is an attempt to convey the sort of fractured media culture that we now inhabit, where we're getting stuff from all over the place as opposed to typically sitting down and reading a 547-page novel. Um, and part of it was just it's really fun to work on all these different voices. And, you know, the bloggers and certainly the editorial page pages of the Wall Street Journal and Mr. Higginsworth and the, the god-awful writer of that novel all have radically different voices. And so it was really, and the, their mysterious narrator of the novel has a distinctive voice. And it was a really fun exercise to write in all those different voices. One thing I thought was funny about the bad science fiction novel you were just talking about is that the author of that science fiction novel says this isn't science fiction it's speculative fiction yeah yeah i was just curious if that is a, a margaret atwood nod or oh no I, I it's um i usually describe my own work as speculative fiction too um i think i first got it from neil stevenson um i think it, it, and i loosely think of it as being um, more present day so sort of like maybe more like uh more like uh, Black Mirror, you know, sort of tweaking the present day than necessarily going deep future or going, you know, alien. Um, but I, it's a term that I think is useful. But I, my, um, my writer uses it, the, the writer of the bad novel uses it somewhat pompously. Yeah. Um, because he's just kind of a pompous character. And I figured in his particular case, he wouldn't necessarily even understand what the difference between the two terms are. And by the way, it's a pretty porous definition anyway. Did you... Did you have sort of a conscious list of ways that this author would be bad in his writing, or did you just sort of seat of the pants? This is what feels like bad writing to me as I'm writing. Oh no, it's very it is it is based on a terrible novel uh that has um all kinds of there's very particular things that he does wrong repeatedly yeah, yeah. he's bad at capitalization he's big into double negatives um he's got these very pompous asides that he throws in and this is based on the first novel that i wrote when i was um, right out of college and thank god never finished <laughs> and i rediscovered that ghastly writing of me as a um, very earnest but not very gifted 22-year-old writer. And I, I stumbled across that right around when I was starting this. I was like, wow, I really sucked at that point, <laughs> but I can use this. And so I'm kind of like parodying myself, That's but a much younger version of me, <laughs> which I think I get to do. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you mentioned that you got feedback on the manuscript from a bunch of internet you know, well-known internet people, including Chris Anderson, Stuart Brand, Hugh Howey, and your wife, Morgan Webb. I'm yep. just curious, could you talk about what kind of feedback they gave you on the manuscript? Yeah, I'm probably lunatic fringe um, when it comes to novelists in terms of how much I engage 
um, sort of alpha tester readers. And I like to get, you know, my full first draft. I like to, if I can, I like to get as many as a dozen people to read the whole thing, which is a no small ask to make of somebody, obviously, because you're asking them to sign up for a dozen, you know, a dozen plus hours. This is a long book, it's 547 pages. This is probably closer to 20 hours for people to read and also to, to make copious notes in the margin. And then, uh, and so all those people on the acknowledgments page, um, act, in fact, read early versions of the book uh, and early versions. There were different early versions because as I was rewriting it, I'd give two or three people, you know, version, you know, 0 0.71, 0 0.72, 0 0.73. Uh, but all of those people made that great sacrifice of spending dozens of hours of grappling with the early drafts. And then what I do is um, I'm very interested in, I ask people to make certain marks when they find something funny, certain marks when they find something stupid, inconceivable. There's this little shorthand that I ask them to employ, and I ask them to scribble all the notes they can. And I give them a physical printout, which is obnoxious. It's like this big, <laughs> big binder. And this one was especially big, right? Like a three-ring binder. And I get these things back, and then I make something that I call Mr. Master. Mr. Master is a copy of the book that has, I transpose all those things in different colors of ink. And so I end up having this thing, which is almost like, by when, hand, by yeah, hand, I, do it by, I do it by hand. It's, I'm insane. And Oh, and it's a it's hard because there's different versions of the book, and you know this is there's nothing that's level headed or, or or sane about this process. But what I end up having at the end of that is I have this document in which it's almost like doing it in front of a live audience, um, not a live audience, but I see like sometimes you see like seven people thought that was funny. That must be pretty funny. <laughs> or, or there's like this incredible unanimity or everybody's scribbling in the margins here. And I see the different colors of ink. I'm like, ooh, that was more. That was Hugh. Oh, Chris didn't like this one. And um, I think intelligent feedback from, uh, you know, early readers who care and have, you know, have, have an interest or not a stake, but, a, you know, an emotional interest in your success is incredibly valuable. And you've got to be really good at both taking feedback and ignoring it. You've got to be very good at because you're not going to please everybody, right? And I've always benefited from that in my writing. Not everybody wants to let outsiders into their creative process, and I totally respect that. Um, I'm, I happen to be a little lunatic fringe in this. I mean, could you say, I think you went through four major drafts of this or something? Yeah, about that. Yeah. Um, were the, is there anything you could say about what the earlier drafts were doing that you wanted to? They were change? long. <laughs> they were longer. I mean, this book is long. Um, I always, I always write, I mean, with all four of my books, they've started out much, much longer, even as I edit pretty relentlessly as I'm writing. But inevitably, you've got a lot more there. You know, you need to carve back. And I, I really think, for me at least, the way my creative process works, um, you know, 20% of the time, but 80% of the quality really comes in that rewriting process. And actually, it's probably more like... 35 or 40% of the time. I spent a lot of time rewriting. Um, but it's a lot of carving back. Um, it's a lot of really sharpening the voices and really, really making them distinct from one another, making your characters sort of separate from one another and, and come into just greater fundamental, um, have, fundally, have it fundamentally different perspectives on what's happening and make sure that those perspectives are authentic to who this person is as they're represented and endemic to the situation so that the conflicts as they emerge, which are really going to drive the drama, um, feel very, very natural. They don't feel forced. And so it's the pairing back and that sharpening of the voices and, and the, their distinct perspectives on what's happening that I focus on in a rewrite. Because, I mean, this is a book that is absolutely packed with ideas. I mean, it's like we're talking about the simulation hypothesis, then two pages later we're talking about the fine-tuning the fundamental constants, we're talking about the psychology of terrorism. You know, do you, um, is that sort of a, a conscious project to load the book up with ideas or that's just your, how it comes out. That's just right. what goes, that it's kind of what goes on in my brain. So I, I, I a rabid, you know, just a ravenous reader and I read, um, at least as much nonfiction and as I do fiction and I read, you know, a lot of short form stuff. So I get exposed to a lot of stuff and I've always been very, very drawn to these fundamental questions, things like Fermi's paradox, um, things like the anthropomorphic coincidences, things like simulation theory, et cetera. And I felt that, and then also, you know, early in my 
earliest adulthood, um, I studied a lot of Arabic and lived in the Middle East as a Fulbright scholar in Cairo. And uh, I started thinking about, you know, there was, we were in a bit of a lull in that, at that time frame, but terrorism has been an issue there. And so that was something that's been deep in my mind. Um, so that's, that was kind of like a froth of ideas that I felt were all connected really to the story and could integrate into it in a way that added depth and interest, um, without hopefully without being ham fisted and like, here's another idea for you. <laughs> I believe me, I left a lot of stuff out. The things that were new to me. So I've spent most of my adult life thinking about Fermi's paradox. Yeah. I've spent much of my life since I first, not my life, but much of my time since I first heard about it, thinking about simulation theory. That's obviously not most of my life. The things that were new to me, I hadn't spent a lot of time thinking about um, consciousness and the roots of consciousness. And that was something that I had to learn about a lot on my own. Neuroscience, I hadn't spent much time looking into that. I had to learn a lot about that on my own. And then synthetic biology. So those are all big sub-themes of the, of the book that I really had to teach myself. Um, but a lot of the rest of it is just, that's just what's bubbling in my head. All right, so I have to ask you, this is a little bit of a tangent, but you mentioned the Fermi paradox. And one of the ideas in the book is about the, as you mentioned, the dangers of AI run amok. Yes. And so there's sort of a variation on the Fermi paradox, which is that if AI is so dangerous that it might, you know, uh, wake up and then three days later, it's turning everything in the universe into, you know, material for its own consciousness or so on. Why has that not happened yet? You know, given the billions of years old that the universe is, and is that uh, comforting in any way? Yeah. So that is, I mean, boy, we I could talk about Fermi's <laughs> paradox for a very, very, very long time. But that is that solution. You know, uh, the, it's, they're usually referred to as solutions, and and kind of in scare quotes because obviously we don't know what the solution is. But the solution that says you know, there could be this sort of AI run amok thing that would really turn the entire universe into a computing substrate. It, perhaps in, if we have a very ambitious AI that wants to get very smart and that demonstrably hasn't happened. Um, therefore, do we take comfort that maybe that AI thing doesn't run, am that AI running amok thing doesn't happen because it would have landed here by now. Um, you know, there's a couple things that, that, that might explain that. And one of them is, you know, kind of like, um, a broad set of arguments that sometimes get put in the rubric of rare earth, which basically says maybe we're the first people to actually get to this level of development. And a surprisingly, for somebody who grew up on science fiction and grew up completely convinced that the earth was, the universe was densely populated with aliens, it never crossed my mind that that wasn't the case probably until 10 or 15 years ago. It just seemed you know, self-evident, just the enormities of space and time that other intelligence would have arisen. Um, but as, as you get in deeper into the Fermi's, Fermi's paradox, you realize problems like that do come up. And you realize that perhaps we've, you know, there are a lot of very good solutions to that, that say we are fundamentally alone. And our aloneness could stem from there being a great filter in the past that we managed to surmount, that complex life is a very, very difficult thing to get going. It sure took a lot of time on this planet. We had simple life very early, and then it took almost a quarter of, a quarter of the universe history for us to get a complex life. So that could explain that. Uh, or there is the more chilling explanation that civil civilizations one way or another reliably destroy themselves and therefore we're alone. Now we may not have seen if this runaway AI thing is an inevitable, inevitable consequence of AI. The reason that that AI may turn its own biosphere and, and solar system even into a very tight, um, you know, nanotech enabled computing substrate, but not gone beyond that is simply at some point you have speed of light constraints. If you do, let's say, you know, in a really fun sci-fi scenario, uh, an AI does arise that takes over its planet and converts the entire planet and all the people who created it into computonium <laughs> that can actually, you know, just very, very fast nano, and it gets bigger and it, it, it turns its equivalent of the moon and Mars and a couple other things into it, maybe even its sun into it. At some point, however compact that, that wad of intelligence is, the constraints of the speed of light are going to prevent it from having a unified set of thoughts. And that could be the reason why these things only, if they happen, only get so large and then stop growing. Now, at that point, we're already at an incomprehensible intelligence <laughs> compared to us. So who knows what their objectives would be? Well, right. Because if it grows beyond that point, it would 
diverge into different consciousnesses that might yeah. be threats to one another. Yeah, it might be might diverge into rival consciousnesses. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, it's a it's just fun <laughs> fun topic. All right. Well, so tell us about your podcast that you launched in conjunction with the novel. Yeah. So this is um, tied to really what we just talked about. So I was in the when I was writing it, I did a lot of research into things that I didn't really know much about myself. Neuroscience, as I mentioned, um, quantum computing was something that I didn't know much about. So I had these fun interviews, and this also can t- pertains to what we spoke about it just before, which is how long was that book in its 1.0 <laughs> form? And so I got so excited. Just sorry about, for context. How long was the process of writing the book from start to finish? Um, it was three years of unbelievably full-time work. Okay. Uh, I would say I ballparked it to 7,500 hours. Wow. So if a normal working year, 40 hours a week, which I've never really done, <laughs> um, is 2,000 hours. Um, this was a little less than three years and I'm going to say it was about 7,500 hours and probably within about 10%. So I was working pretty flat out on this thing the whole time. Um, and so I got so excited about synthetic biology and how cool it is and fascinating issues and the threats that it could present that I started filling the book with these really fun digressions about all this stuff. And then my editor, Trisha Narwani, who is a brilliant editor, and we had incredible symbiosis in, in creating this thing, um, you know, kind of pointed out like, you know, Rob, these things are really not good for your plot and they <laughs> kind of have to go. Not entirely. I mean, I think you can still learn a great deal about synthetic biology and neuroscience and so forth from this book. Um, but I couldn't be you know, completely expository and laying out as much as I'd like to. So I was, I was thinking, as the book was coming out, like, why don't I do a very limited series podcast, eight interviews in which I re-interview some of the people who helped me a lot or and or interview other experts on related topics. And so that's how the podcast got started. And that's why the podcast has the name, The After On Podcast. And um, so of that eight episode series, um, I'm about to post episode number 50. (laughs) So like you, because I know a bit about your own background, um, getting into podcasting and interviewing people and having access to great people to interview, which is what I had back when I wrote that book about the internet. Um, and I hadn't had that again for 20 years, just turned out to be really intoxicating. And so I've continued with that project. And so the After On podcast, um, the first eight episodes were loosely tied to the novel. The subsequent 42 episodes and those which come uh, really just share the name. But the thrust of it still continues in that it's, it's uh, I call it unhurried conversations with thinkers, founders, and scientists. And it's really heavily focused towards scientists now, but not exclusively. And what I try to do is um, find somebody who's very, very, very top in their field. Um, so a recent uh, episode featured Stuart Russell, who is certainly one of the top two or three most prominent academics in AI. Um, I was lucky enough to um, interview George Church, who is without question one of the, you know, I'd say three or four most influential bioengineer, bioengineers in the world. You know, I've talked to some of the top people in astrophysics, astronomy, which fascinates me, um, a lot of people in neuroscience, et cetera. And so I try to get, when I get somebody brilliant who's, who's got a big, big body of work that they've contributed to the world, I spend dozens of hours preparing to interview them with their cooperation you know they help they point me to you know no, the not, lectures not spying on them yeah 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 <laughs> no, they're, they're, they know they're going to be on the show and uh we both have an interest in the understanding being as smart as possible about their work and so i spend dozens of hours getting ready for the interview and then we we sit down and have a long interview that i then um edit you know for parsimony and clarity and my goal is to make that person's life work accessible to anybody who's any ambitious listener anybody's going you know say okay this synthetic biology it's complicated it's going to take a while i can listen carefully and um so it's really really deep dives in this stuff but it's definitely the conversations are at a level that are accessible to really anybody who cares to find out what X is all about. And um, I'm able to do about two a month. And that, again, it's pretty full. It's very full time. Um, and I, it's been a blast, though. Well, and it's very important for you to do them face to face and not yeah. over Skype. You go to a lot of trouble to, yeah. to do that. Yeah, I go. I've probably done all but... Um, I think I've only done two, um, you know, remotely. And so I do travel all over the country. I mean, I'm based in New York City, but I've done probably more interviews in California than anywhere else. Um, I went to Cambridge to interview the Astronomer Royal, um, Martin Rees. He's somebody who's very interested in existential risks and obviously very interested in astronomy. And these are two very big topics of mine. So yeah, I travel around a lot. I do this very methodical preparation and, um, it's been pretty all-consuming, but it's been a really cool education. 
And it seems, I mean, very successful. I mean, it'll, you have over a thousand five star ratings on iTunes. You have over a thousand pat- uh, patrons on Patreon. Yeah, I've got over yeah, exactly, exactly. It's um, yeah, it's thirteen hundred maybe on iTunes ratings total. Not all of them are five stars, but thank God the average is five, and <laughs> I, I appreciate that. And yeah, it's about a, th- a little over a thousand on Patreon. Is there anything like particular? Um, what would you attribute that to the success of the podcast? I don't know. I think. Um, you know, a couple of people, I, I think the, the, an early start came, it was really helpful. I interviewed Sam Harris, who has a very, very big yeah. audience, and because he's been very outspoken about terrorism and lone wolf terrorism as a theme in the book. And so we sat down for a conversation, and it turned into a really interesting exploration of really just sort of his life story. And he's a podcaster that is one of the people that sort of drew me to the to the domain um, because he does have these very long, in-depth conversations. And he and I don't agree on 100% of things by any stretch, but I think he's a hell of an interviewer. And he's a really, really good guy. I've gotten to know him and I've been very, very blessed in that relationship. And so he was on and when he heard the episode, um, he's, he felt that it was an interesting enough um exploration of his own background that he, he asked if he could post it to his own feed. And so I think I got a lot of listeners um, early on because he's got like a million listeners, right? And so was a t- some tiny percentage of them said, oh, I want to, I mean, but that's all it takes when it's a big yeah. audience, right? So I think that got me my first few thousand listeners. And from then, it's just really been word of mouth. Now, um, some of the guests are well-known, like George Church. And then, you know, I guess when you Google George Church, you dive deep enough, you're going to find our interview. Um, some of the guests have big Twitter followings. Um, so I think sometimes a, a guest will lead to a burst, but I think it's just mainly word of mouth. You know, so yeah, so I listened to your interview with Sam Harris, which I thought was great. And I, I can definitely see why he wanted, you know, cause, uh, cause I've listened to a lot of interviews with him and it just went into areas like particularly of his life story that I had never heard before. Um, I also listened to your interview with Stuart Russell, which was also really interesting about some of these things we we're talking about, the dangers of AI. And, um, yeah, that was pretty scary. I mean, he says that he thinks that AI is possibly the greatest danger facing humanity. Now, I would probably put it in my top maybe five or six, but it's I would put, you know, uh, nuclear weapons probably number one. I would have uh, climate change slash ecological collapse, uh, genetically engineered p- pandemics would all probably be above AI and things that I lose sleep at night about. Where do you where would you put AI? I put SynBio at the top of that list. So I think we have the same list of concerns. I think we're going to face, um, you know, an existential fork in the road much sooner with SynBio than we will with AI. And so for me, um, AI could certainly, certainly could pose a risk, but it, and and I, you know, everybody's estimate is, is, (laughs) is a gut thing, but for a variety of reasons, I feel like that is a several decades out thing, um, like maybe five, six, seven decades out. Whereas synthetic biology, um, I could see something really turning sideways uh, and running amok as soon as a single decade or maybe two or three decades out. It's, it feels much more near term. And so I think we need to be very creative, smart, and perhaps lucky in handling the explosion of capability and the proliferation of capability that's going to come with SynBio we have to shoot those rapids before what you just, we... For people who might not know, just what is SynBio? Yeah, so SynBio, synthetic biology. And so that basically is shorthand for engineering DNA and editing DNA and tweaking DNA to create novel creatures that never existed in nature before and almost certainly never would exist in nature to do something that we find useful. And, um, you know, the, there are countless... Um, benign and very empowering uses that we can get from this. I think that SynBio writ large over, you know, the coming decades could do a profound amount of good in terms of helping, helping uh, human health, um, in terms of helping, uh, uh, you know, perhaps reverse some of the dangers of climate catastrophe, um, could do a great deal to improve our relations with <laughs> other critters. You know, there's all kinds of really interesting things that are already starting to show up in terms of synthetic meat, which might be, you know, cleaner from an environmental standpoint and healthier and tastier and cheaper than the real thing. And so when you get all of that, why make a cow live in a factory farm, right? So there's a lot of really pr- profound potential to it. But what's both exciting and scary about it is 
it's accelerating and compounding at an exponential that's steeper than that of Moore's law. And so if you look at the measurable things, sort of the raw measurable things in synthetic biology, you probably look above all at the cost of reading a base pair of DNA, uh, which is also called sequencing. It's a fancy way of saying reading. Uh, and you'd look at the cost of synthesizing a base pair of DNA. And those are pretty hard costs. You can say cost uh, per ba you know, pen, you know, base pairs per penny and track that back over time and compare that exponential curve to what we've seen with Moore's Law, which again, pretty measurable. You know, how much does it cost to make a transistor? And it's steeper than that. And I think the very a powerful illustration of that is the Human Genome Project uh, took 13 years. It cost $3 billion. It ended in 2003, not ancient times. I mean, W was in the White House and <laughs> Friends was on TV, right? This is not <laughs> something that is in the deep past. We're not talking about Fairchild Semiconductor in the 50s, right? So $3 billion, uh, 13 years, thousands of the brightest minds in life science. That, that unit of work, the sequencing of the human genome, can now be done um, by a smart, well-trained high school grad um, with maybe a couple hours of their time over, but also with things would have to sit and stew in a box for more than a couple hours, but just, you know, a couple hours of a smart high school kid's time uh, and about a thousand dollars worth of reagents and energy and, you know, amortization of the equipment. And so that's amazing. And when you think that this entire, that which the entire field was able to do in 13 years can now be done by an individual. Then you think about, well, what will SynBio as a field, are, you know, the editing of genomes, whether it's for medical reasons, for food, for fun, whatever it is, what will the field accomplish over the next 13 years? Put that in a box. We don't know what it is. We can postulate. It's going to be a lot. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be a great 13 years. Put that in a box and say, well, what happens when a well-trained undergrad or high school kid can do that unit of work in an afternoon, maybe 30 years from now or 40 years from now? And you very quickly realize that, you know, this is an exponential curve. We can't, I can't even guess what SynBio is going to be doing in 13 years. But whatever it is, I can tell you that someday, not long after that, you know, a smart high college kid and eventually a smart high school kid and eventually a dumb eighth grader hmm. will be able to do that stuff with the far more powerful tools and simple tools and techniques that will exist in X decades out. And all it takes is one determined malevolent actor to do something really, really destructive. I mean, we, we have several hundred people throughout this world each year for, you know, very internal reasons come to the point where they decide they want to die in the act of killing as many people as possible to take just one extreme example. Um, if somebody gets animated with that, with that desire and they have access to tools as powerful as what SynBio is going to bring to the world soon, um, really bad things can result from that. Now that's, kind of an extreme case, but, you know, less extreme cases or ones that are more accessible. It's like, okay, well, what about when groups, you know, like the lone individual exterminating the whole world can seem pretty far-fetched. Well, what can a group accomplish? There have certainly been doomsday cults out there. Um, what could a national government accomplish if a national government figures out that, you know, our people have certain genetic markers, that other people lack. And so we, if we could do something very aggressive toward people we don't like by creating, you know, engineering pathogens that can discriminate, you know, who somebody is uh, genetically, racially, et cetera, there's a lot of bad things that could happen. And what we don't really intuitively grasp is how widely proliferated that can be. I mean, nuclear risk, that's the existential risk we're all, uh, uh, you know, acquainted with. It still takes the resources of a nation state to create a nuclear weapon. Well, let me say, I mean, if you haven't read it, you should read, um, I interviewed Daniel Ellsberg. He wrote a book called The Doomsday Machine, and he had actually drawn up the United oh, the, States' nuclear plans. Yeah, I've heard it keep going. I've heard about this. And so what was shocking to me in that book is everyone, you, you think, well, you know, you, nuclear weapons could destroy the world, but there's a small number of people who could press the button to start the war. But he goes through how that's actually not really true, that at every, essentially every level of commands and control, all the safeguards only really exist in theory and not in practice. So there's a lot of people who could run amok. Right. Essentially, once you scramble the bombers, any one of those bomber pilots could choose to start a nuclear war, and there's nothing other than the rules to yeah. stop them. Yeah. And this proliferates. However, that's... I got to read that. Yeah. When did it come out? 
Just in the past year or two. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, good. Thank you for the book recommendation. He had drawn up the nuclear war plans back in, I forget, the 50s or 60s, I think, but it, it had been, he had kept it under wraps until he wrote this book. Interesting. Um, wow, I'm going to dig that up. Well, however proliferate that is, um, and it is, and it's scary. You know, most people don't do awful things when they can. It's just the, it, when the group of people who are in a position to do something awful grows and grows and grows, at some point, a subset of them are reliably going to do something awful. We had 323 mass shootings in the United States last year. You know, that's a pretty tiny number when you think about how many Americans there are. Most of us don't do that, but a tiny number of us do. And when the numbers start getting big, you know, there's there's probably over 100,000 commercial flights a day. It's very rare for a pilot to crash their plane deliberately in a suicidal act in which they can script 150 other people. But, you know, it happened with that Malaysian Airlines plane. It happened with that German Wings flight. These are, these are just in the last few years. So when the numbers start getting – the number of empowered people starts getting big, um, the likelihood of – a drastic incident grows very, very large. And that's what worries me about Synbio. Yeah, well, and I watched your TED Talk, which why don't you just say, if people want to go look up this TED Talk? Yeah, yeah. So the TED Talk, um, I, I gave a talk at the most recent TED conference in April. And as it happened... I did it. I don't know if you knew this. I did it on 10 days notice. I, I, yeah, I, I think you said that. I think I might have mentioned that to you. So what happened was, as a result of this podcast, really as a result of this book. So I've started getting interested in synthetic biology risk as a re result of writing this book. I am, to be clear, a big Synbio fanboy. I am awed and I indeed revere its potential. But I started worrying about the risks when I wrote the book. And uh, then the podcast has explored those risks. And eventually I did um, an interview with a guy named Naval Ravikant. It was a two-part episode on, in, after on back in March. And he, like me, is not an existential risk professional. He's just – he's a very, very thoughtful person, a very um, well-regarded and very impressive entrepreneur who's also a very deep thinker. And we found out um, that we thought about these things in similar ways. And so that episode, it's actually a two-part episode, like I mentioned, was more a conversation than an interview. And, th and we really talked about existential risk and a lot about synthetic biology. And then the TED people, um, that kind of, I guess it went viral inside the TED offices. <laughs> and, and a couple of weeks later, they're like, oh, the conference is in like real soon, but would you like to speak about this? And so I, I pulled that together on pretty short notice and distilled, um, distilled everything into a 17 minute argument is basically what it is and talked about, you know, first of all, the, that fact that a certain number of people simply run amok. Uh, and when they do, technology is the force multiplier and synthetic biology has got this wild promise, but it also has this wild downside that, you know, it will proliferate the ability to do, you know, things that go far beyond what happens, the awfulness that happens when you crash an airplane. And, um, that talk went up on uh, that talk will have gone up a few days before we go up. So the talk goes up, I think, on June eighteenth, which is a Tuesday. And when will this episode post? Uh, this will be the twenty second. Yeah. So this will be very, very easy to find on the TED website. Um, and I'll probably embed it on my own site, which is after on dot com, where the podcast lives. Uh, because I'll be posting on the 18th when the TED Talk goes live, uh, an interview that I gave about the, the TED Talk with somebody who was in the audience when it happened. And it really, um, there, there's so much nuance and complexity to the risk that we face. But, but I, what I tried to convey was the nature of the danger uh, of the first two thirds. And then at the end, the fact that there's a path forward, this is not destiny. There's a lot of things that we can do to forestall any malevolent actor from being able to unleash a pathogen that catches us unawares. Um, we have time. I think this is a decade or two or three in the future. And we can leverage all of these, these incredible price performance curves that synthetic biology is riding to create our layers of defense. And I think what we need to create as, you know, as a, as a, as humanity is a multi-tiered and very agile immune system. That's kind of how we fight off pathogens as individuals. And mammalian in immune systems are incredible case studies in, in agility and robustness and self-training and so forth. And so basically I call for that at the end. And I, I, I stress tested these arguments with most of the top people that I know in Synbio and because of the podcast, that's, that's a lot of the biggies. And they all said, I hate to say this, Rob, but you're, there's, there aren't really any holes in the argument. This is a real risk. And so I actually spent a fair amount of time with a couple of them in particular saying, what's the, what do we, what should we call for? 
What's the way out? And that's the most important part of the talk. That's really the last four or five minutes. Well, I love to this idea that you might just have a machine in your house that dynamically generates vaccines for you in response to the threats out in the world. And that is at this moment science fiction, but there's no reason it has to be science fiction 15 years from now. You know, the basically the two of the layers that are critical um, are going to be massive network detection system, pathogen detection, germ detection system. And the other piece would be, you know... So uh, everybody has a virus detector on their phone. Yeah, so we've got, we've got okay-ish pathogen detectors already, but, you know, they're, they're probably 1% of what we'd like them to be in terms of their throughput, their accuracy, how much sampling they can do, and they're not very widespread. So with a bit of R&D muscle... Um, and with, you know, a bit of a commitment, you know, perhaps from, you know, multiple governments, we all face the same threat here, to put this technology to really shove it down that price performance curve, these things could become increasingly intelligent, capable, and networked. And networked is really, really critical. And there's no reason that they can't become as widespread as smoke detectors and over the long term um, as widespread as smartphones. There are already pathogen sensors that do essentially hook up uh, to smartphones that are reasonably you know, um, agile, but they're nothing like what we'd like to see. Then the other, so, so imagine instead of, you know, being ambushed by a pandemic, which is what we currently have happened to us, you know, imagine if we have increasingly sensitive net, sensor, sensors all over the place. That's level one. Well, now, oh my God, we've found a threat, whether it's natural or unnatural. You know, maybe Ebola just manages to naturally become contagious. That sort of thing could happen. Or there's, a, there's some kind of a terrorist or, or, or pathogen attack. Now what you need is you need to be able to create vaccines or other kinds of antidotes Very dynamically, you need to create them at the edge. If we're making everything in Atlanta at the Centers for Disease Control and we're making vaccines years in advance, we're making them, you know, using, you know, basically mass production techniques and we're putting them in refrigeration and and so forth. um, That that system is designed to prevent the kinds of yesterday's pandemic. Um, If there could be very, very dynamic uh, disease environment, you need to be able to have the production capability at the edge. Now, there is already printer technology in the lab for medicines and other kinds of antidotes and vaccines is something that can be done. This is DNA printing. This is one of the things that could be hijacked by wrong, by the, by the bad people. But this is something that is improving at these incredible rates. And if we make the idea, I, I would see an agile biomanufacturing force at the edge, maybe starting in pharmacies. So if like every pharmacy acquires the capability to print, you know, a lot of the FDA, first of all, the FDA repertoire, you know, why not print things in the pharmacy? If the pharma companies might find that to be very attractive, you know. But you have that capability in the pharmacies, and again, over time, that's something that could go as far as our homes. And even some people that I've talked to um, suggest, you know, it could ultimately be on our skin or even within our bodies. This stuff will as with the computing, miniaturize and become more and more ubiquitous. Yeah. Uh, I was struck by this line in the book where one of the characters says, many have feared that there's no way humanity can survive the rise of super AI, but I fear there's no way humanity can survive without a super AI, uh, without something to watch over us. Is that where we are, do you think? Yeah, so this gets to the, all the things we, we you know, the, the book explores, and I think a lot of uh, thinkers in tech have explored the things that could go wrong with, with, with a super AI. Um, there's also a lot of awful things we could do to ourselves. And if we do get into an, a situation in which really, you know, the kinds of destructive powers that used to reside just in nuclear superpowers become very widely proliferated, how do you prevent, you know, a catastrophe from happening? And there is one, when I think about that, when I think about, you know, send bio run amok, let's say nanotechnology run amok, maybe geoengineering. Um, all the things that could be created in an imaginable future that in the wrong hands could be very destructive. How do you prevent seven and a half billion people from hitting that red button? It was hard enough in the Cold War when there were two or maybe or a couple hundred. Nine or ten billion in a yeah. couple of years. Whatever the number is, like how do you keep them from hitting the, the red button? And one stable outcome could be a benign super AI, a good guy super AI that doesn't want to turn us all into computronium, <laughs> that doesn't really have any ambition to, you know, do anything other than cherish us and preserve us and protect us from ourselves. Um, Such an imaginable AI, if it took the Nick Bostrom route and became a true super AI before any others, could do a couple of things. First of all, it could prevent any other AIs from coming along. Because when you think about the type of improvement cycle 
a super AI could put itself on by better leveraging, you know, software techniques and production techniques that we can't imagine because that's a super AI, it would get so far ahead of its any you know, potential competitor, it could probably saturate the computing networks and the communication networks and become aware of any credible attempt to create a comp competitor to itself and nip that in the bud. So if you get a good guy super AI at the very, very beginning, you may never have to worry about a bad guy super AI, so long as the good guy super AI is, uh, AI is on its digital toes. <laughs> now, the other thing that this hypothetical good guy super AI could prevent is all these destructive things that humans could do. So th that that's a character saying that. I don't know if I believe that or not, but it's something that I think may be possible. And so it's a provocative idea that I put in the book, you know, maybe we can't survive without one of these things, but that's scary because that means we have to create one of these things that in a lot of scenarios could do us in. It's going to be a very interesting century. Are these things made up or are these real? The Ahab outcome, the Midas pitfall, the three wishes snafu, maximal moral outcomes, minimized man, and the coherent extrapolated volition? Uh, I think most of those came from my bad science fiction novel, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you yeah, I mean, these are the scenarios. Yeah, that, yeah. Uh, these are these constructs um, all do the, these these constructs all do exist. These scenarios all do, are in the super AI risk uh, literature. Um, I think my bad my, my bad author gave them very sort of typical for him, very colorful names. But in this case, um, I think easier names to hang on to because the names for these sort of things tend to be. Um, very academic. Okay. So yeah, there was, all of that. If thought, I read Stuart Russell's book, there are these. Yeah, you'll find it. You'll find. Um, you'll find most of them in Stuart Russell's book, and what you don't find there, you'll find in Nick Bostrom's book. Okay. For sure. And Stuart Russell's book is going to be amazing. Um, I think it comes out in September or October. I read. T I read two versions of it um, and prep for our interview, but it's it's going to be a very import important book. Another thing from your interview with him that really jumped out at me was the slaughterbots. Yeah, that to me, that is amazing. So I encourage anybody listening to this to Google slaughterbots. It's a video that um, somehow is produced under Stewart's direction. He's he is a he is a classic mild mannered British professor. Happens to be at UC Berkeley. Um, but somehow he got the director's chair and 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 orchestrated this seven or eight minute video, which is incredible. And it talks about what could happen when drone technology runs amok. And in this particular case, um, he doesn't really have an AI being the actor. I mean, there's a lot of technologies. I mean, drones feel pretty benign. But if you push them down their own Moore's Law curve, as they're inevitably traveling, um, one could imagine some, and, and Stewart has imagined, and some other people, I'll mention one in a moment, have imagined incredibly destructive scenarios. So there was one that, this was sort of explored in a Black Mirror episode. Black Mirror does a really good job of exploring a lot of these ideas. But the risk that Stewart points to in drones is what he calls scalable weapons of mass destruction. And so a near future drone swarm uh, that has very, very good recognition technologies, is powered by narrow AI in terms of how it darts and swarms and finds people and so forth. A, a, a next generation drone swarm could conceivably be unleashed and let's say target, you know, 50 of the thousand most important politicians in a rival country. Target with explosives. Uh, target with tiny little drones that have explosive charges that are, have the effect of basically being able to kill somebody very surgically. Um, and so this is a scenario that's explored in Slaughterbots, uh, which is the great title of the YouTube <laughs> video. And when you can start having a scalable weapon of mass destruction, like we can kill 50 of your thousand most important politicians, we could also probably kill a million people in any arbitrary city. The, the, the logic of mutual assured destruction goes by the wayside. You know, the Cuban Missile Crisis didn't result in a nuclear war because it's all over for everybody. It was absolutely totable, total. But what if you could kill 50 people and they could kill 50 on our side and then escalate it to 10,000 and back and forth? Suddenly that destabilizes things a great deal. And, um, you know, that's an existential risk that even I didn't contemplate in this cheerful novel of mine, <laughs> but it's something that we need to think about. And I think Stuart's video illustrates it magnificently and very chillingly. Wow. Yeah, I actually haven't watched the video yet. But oh, do. Check that out. Oh, do. Yeah, it's <laughs> really, really, really well done. I also want to ask you about one of the um, sort of themes in the book is how end user license agreements can be used to strip people of their rights, basically. So, and you make the point that, there, there's no human 
there's no way possible to actually read all the end user license. It's physically impossible. It's like like impossible by the number of minutes in our lives right. to read all of the EULAs that we find ourselves clicking yes on. Is there a solution to that? Um, you know, I think that we're we're entering the phase now where th there's going to be like basically the government is going to assert itself, and we were starting to hear very very significant saber rattling in Washington. Um, you know, challenging Facebook and Google and other real giants of our industry. And I think that what it comes down to is there's, the only solution I can imagine is if there is a, a templatized EULA that is legit, you know, and whether there is government coercion that everybody needs to use this or there is the coercion of the marketplace where whether it's EFF or, you know, Creative Commons or somebody else comes up with a very simple templatized EULA, which is like the EULA, and you add, you know, whichever provisions you want to add. And part of our jobs as citizens is to kind of become familiar with that thing and familiar with which of the 10 things we're comfortable with and which of the 10 things we're not. If there's some kind of standardization around that, that would be the, the ultimate solution. And if that standardization does not emerge and we do continue to click, I agree, I consent on things because there's really no alternative to doing that, um, we can become and, you know, you can enter a very, very unfavorable uh, legal and economic relationship with, with entities without even realizing it. You think uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation is who we should rally around? EFF is, uh, it's, uh, I'm not expert in this domain, but to me, EFF is the immediate and most logical entity that has the legal resources, the financial resources, the respect and the network within the tech community. Um, it's a, it's a native of the tech community, but it's also a watchdog of it. And it has, um, you know, has a good relationship. I think EFF is is well respected um, by those the people and the companies that it calls out and has and can reach them in a way that very few other people can. Yeah, that sounds good. To Could me. be the ACLU. You know, there's other organizations that would take this on, but EFF seems like the perfect one. I also want to run this. So one of the uh, blurbs for this book is from NPR. They say, after on is like an extended philosophy seminar run by a dozen insane Cold Wars heads of station, three millennial COOs, and that guy you went to college with who always had the best weed but never did his laundry. <laughs> I like that. Have you, um, so, uh, I, I wish think? I'd run that myself, but I, I, can't, I can't disagree with a word of it. What do you think it, it is about the book that brings about the best weed but never did his laundry? Um, I think that it's probably a reference – to the um, you know the instinctive sense that that nerdy people tech people are are bad about personal hygiene maybe <laughs> um, and then um, I think with both of my my books um, it's funny I have very little drug experience but with both of my books there's been a presumption that this is such a madcap tale that it somehow must be inspired by drugs I can't say that it was in either case. It's interesting because I don't know uh, if you're familiar with all these examples, but the books that kind of came to mind for me as, as points of reference reading after on were, I mean, Catch-22, I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah. Um, Thank you. I, that, I read, that was another one I read when I was really young, and, and, uh, which I reread as a grown-up and adored. But yeah, it seemed very much like what Catch-22 does for the military, this does for Silicon Valley. Um, there's a novel by Christopher Buckley called A Little Green Men, which is about sort of a, a, a gut secret government agent designed to trick people into thinking that there are UFOs. I've got to read that. I th it rang a bell when you said it. Okay, cool. I, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, I haven't read it though. And then the third one that really came to mind for me was the Illuminatus trilogy by Robert Anton Wilson and Robert Shea. Also haven't read it, but I'm more I'm familiar with yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And so, um, and I don't know how much drug use was involved in writing that, but certainly my presumption would be a lot. Yeah, not having read it, I wouldn't know. <laughs> I mean, people would probably say that of Douglas Adams, and I, I, I don't know if he was a druggie. I'd I have no reason to think that he was. Yeah, I don't know. You know, um, you know, if I if I had more experience with drugs, I'd probably be more capable of saying what what things must <laughs> clearly have been inspired by it. But um, I actually got that more actually with years with Year Zero because it's such a crazy yeah. storyline. Are there any other um, responses to either of the books that kind of stick out in your mind from reviewers or readers or? Yeah, I what what I love to hear, um, and I get a lot of just sort of steady input from folks on Twitter in, in particular, but also my website has a place where people can email me, so I've gotten messages. You know, the, the thing that um, I really love to hear, and I've heard quite frequently from After On readers, is that, um, you know, I love to hear when, when somebody says that the book, 
you know, drove them to Google a lot because they were really interested in like, oh, wow, <laughs> yeah. you know, if only Rob's editor had allowed him to go on a little bit more <laughs> about synthetic biology here, and now I got to go to Google. When people say that they've been driven to Google a lot, um, or they've gen, and, and again, I think you can genuinely learn quite a bit about particularly synthetic biology and, and uh, neuroscience, because those were really new to me, and I was very excited to talk about them. Um, when people feel like they've learned a lot about the real world, world from the book. And the world is, with the exception of a certain superpower that I invent um, for quantum computing and, and Flutter's emergence, the real, world, the real world is very accurately reflected, I think, in the book. It's funny when you talk about if your editor had let you do, because there's a line in the acknowledgments where uh, your editor snuck some, uh, I forget, hyphens, I think, into the manuscript without... Uh... Oh, I was just a playful, <laughs> that was a playful comment. I, I In the acknowledgments page, um, I do pay enormous respect to my editor, Tricia, because um, it really was, I, it was a great editorial synergy. I mean, sometimes um, there can be very... I don't know, you know, headbutting relations between writers and editors. I've never had that. But in this particular case, um, I felt, you know, her guidance was she would write very, very, very long and detailed memos on the key drafts. And um, she gave me a lot of very good coaching. I thought of her more as a coach than an editor, really, like, you know, kind of like I'm an athlete who is never going to become the best athlete that he can be unless he is in, you know, kind of shaped and guided by a coach. And I really felt that, that but then I think at that said, kind of as a joke, it's like, oh, there's a couple of hyphens we need to talk <laughs> about, Trisha. Uh, but that was just playful. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. So we're pretty much out of time. Do you have any other um, projects you want to mention that you're working on or any final thoughts or anything? Yeah. So um, I did a, um, a, a, I did a bit of writing on this existential risk thing, and I'm going to do more on it. Um, and the most detailed thing that I've written that I'd point people to uh, is I wrote a four-part essay from Medium uh, in the fall. It mostly it ran in October, basically, called Privatizing the, the Apocalypse. And I think anybody who's interested in these issues and uh, particularly if they see this, the TED Talk and they want to get deeper into the ideas that went behind that, that's a lot because it's 11,000 words long. That's a very detailed contemplation on these issues. So that's something I'd point people to. And, and in terms of uh, my next projects, um, I really have been overwhelmed by, first of all, the creation of the TED Talk and then secondarily by kind of getting ready for it to come out. And keeping up with the podcast at the same time, that after the TED Talk comes out, four days before now, for those of you who are listening to it on the day that this comes out, um, there'll probably be another burst of activity in the immediate wake of its release. Um, but really, I'm planning to spend the summer, I've got three or four really interesting projects in front of me that I could do um, that are, you know, some are fiction and some are nonfiction. And I'm going to really spend the summer kind of catching my breath and figuring out what I'm next going to pour myself into. Mm. Do you think the fiction would be science fiction? Oh, yeah. That's yeah. What I, oh, yeah. That's all I do. <laughs> all right. Well, that sounds good to me. So I think we're going to wrap things up there. So we've been speaking with Rob Reed about his new book, After On. So, Rob, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. And that was our interview. So big thanks again to Rob Reed for joining us on the show. And remember that Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is made possible thanks to support from listeners like you. So if you enjoy the show and want it to continue, please sign up to give us a dollar or two per episode over at patreon.com slash geeks. And if you'd rather make a one-time contribution, you can do that via check or PayPal over at geeksguideshow.com slash crowdfunding. And so I want to give a special thank you to Arthur Brown, who just made a one-time contribution to the show via PayPal. So big thanks again to everyone who's contributed. We really appreciate it. All right, so that was our show. So thanks, everyone, for listening, and we'll see you next time. The Geek's Guide to the Galaxy is a production of Wired.com. For more information about the show, visit geeksguideshow.com. To learn more about your host, visit davidbarkertley.com. Music and voiceover produced by yours truly, Jack Kincaid. If you enjoyed this program, tell your friends. If you didn't enjoy it, tell no one. Thank you for listening.